a member of the board of directors of Tool USA. I crack safe and mostly I pick locks. This talk is not going to be about this sort of thing. This is using a thermic lens. It looks really great, especially if you're in a movie. This is actually safe being tested at UL Labs. The whole idea behind a thermic lens is you have a really hot bar that that's, yeah, it's packed with iron and aluminum rods and you run oxygen through it and you basically have a thermite reaction at the tip being fed by a lot of oxygen so it gets really hot and goes through just about anything. It tends to damage the safe when you use it. <laughs> and occasionally damages the contents, especially if they're like paper, like money, which is, you know, if you're a burglar, sometimes a good thing if you're going after the gold, if you're going after the securities or the money, you probably want to use a different technique, which is probably why you're here, not. <laughs> What I'm going to be talking about is non-destructive entry, things like manipulating the lock, playing with the dial, picking the lock. If you're using a lever lock, this is not something I'm going to spend a lot of time talking about because, well, go to the lock pick village and learn how to pick locks to begin with. And then when you figure out that lever locks are a royal pain in the ass because they've been making them really difficult to pick for the last 500 years or whatever it is that they've been around, then you'll realize that you probably want to hold off learning until you get really good at picking the basic ones first. Uh, radiographic attack, which is you stick the lock in an x-ray machine and tell the doctor, well, I think my safe has a broken leg. <laughs> uh, robot dialing, which is when you tell your friendly Roomba to, you know, cozy up to the robot and, you know, dial the correct combination. And, of course, robot manipulation, which is where you have a somewhat more intelligent Roomba. But the first thing I'm going to talk about is manipulation. The thing about manipulation is you see it a lot in movies, kind of like the more destructive entry techniques. You see this in the Italian job, whatever, the hero, heroine, villain, whoever walks up to a safe, pulls out his handy-dandy stethoscope, or perhaps just puts his ear to the safe, and in 30 seconds, click, 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 the safe opens. Sounds really great. I'd certainly love to know how to do that myself, if anybody can teach me. Uh, in reality, it's somewhat more difficult. To understand how it works, you've got to understand how the lock works. A combination lock is basically a box with a couple of wheels in it, and a couple little extra gadgets to make your life difficult. You've got, in this first case labeled A, if you can read that little A down there, a combination lock with two of the wheels set so you can see the gates are aligned. They're, however, aligned in the wrong position. That's one of the important things to remember is that, you know, even if all the gates are correctly aligned, they still have to be aligned under the fence, which is the mechanical device which allows the lock to tell whether or not you dialed the right combination and whether or not you aligned the wheels in the correct place. Like in case B, the wheels are aligned. You can see all the gates lined up, but of course, the lock is not going to open. Those are the gates. That's the thing, the thing called the fence. As I said, the fence is what the lock uses to tell whether you dialed the right combination. If that thing can enter the gates, the lock thinks, hey, this guy's legit. If that thing can't move, the lock is like, sorry, sucker. This is what happens when you get everything right for once. Um, the, you'll note that compared to the upper pictures, relative to the internal components in the, the, of the lock that you see in those pictures, the fence has moved. This is because the lock has actually been opened. What happens is once the fence drops into the gates that have been aligned under the fence, you actually rotate the dial just a little bit more, and the fence moves with the gates back as the lock withdraws the bolt. As I'm going to get to in just a sec, when the bolt has been retracted, however, the, ga the gates are never actually pulling on the bolt. The gates are only telling the bolt, that, no, the, the gates are only telling the fence, yes, you can come in, and then another component is doing the heavy lifting. The reason you can manipulate this kind of lock is because of imperfections in the wheels. This is a particularly bad lock. I don't know how Matt Blaze found this. I stole this shamelessly from his article. I'm going to get to that at the end called Safe Cracking for the Computer Scientist. Um, the center wheel is significantly larger in diameter, at least at that point, than all the other wheels in the lock. This means that if the gate in that center wheel is under the fence, and you are, say, applying pressure to the fence, you would feel the fact that that gate is moving under the fence when you turn the dial. You'd hear that click, click, whatever, maybe even have the whole thing stop. That's really great, except most locks don't make life that simple. The lock that I was talking about hypothetically is called a lock with a direct entry fence. This is what you saw in the old Western movies where they were like crank on the handle and like listen, 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 listen. And one of the reasons they used a, used a stethoscope was because the wheels were manufactured to such, such precise tolerances that you might only hear the barest of clicks 
as that gate moved past and hit that fence, which you were cranking on as hard as your arm would allow. Some people cranked even harder by you know, going over to the office desk and grabbing a typewriter and tying it to the handle. That's a whole other story. These days, after lock manufacturers figured out that you could do this, they introduced a little device called a cam. The cam is a little bit on the back. You'll note that there's this bit on the diagram labeled the nose. It's directly attached to the fence. The whole point of the nose is that it prevents the fence from ever touching the wheels. This seems kind of counterproductive. So they added this little thing called a gate. And I'll get to that in just a sec. The long and short of it is, unless the spindle of the dial is in one particular place, the fence doesn't touch the wheels, which means that no matter how, you, how hard you crank on the handle of the safe, in fact, most safes don't even have you ever touching the actual bits of the lock directly. There it's, it's all interlinked by mechanical linkage. Um, except for this one particular place on the dial, the fence never touches the wheels, which makes it kind of hard to figure out where the gates are in the wheels if, for most of the revolution of the dial, the fence is never actually touching the wheels, and so therefore you have no way of getting information about the state of the dials underneath the fence, except in that one particular place. So the solution. Well, locks are mechanical devices. They, have, they all have their own tolerance. They all have their own imperfections. And most importantly, they have to work. Kind of sucks to come to the office in the morning, dial the combination, and have the lock not work. Then you call a safe technician or your buddy like me and he charges you 200 bucks an hour to come in and open the safe. If this happens a lot, you try to you go out and do something called buying a new safe. <laughs> and then you tell all your buddies, don't ever buy safes from that guy again. In which case, that guy goes out of business, and he's very sad. And he stops buying locks from this manufacturer and tells every, all his friends who make safes not to buy locks from this particular manufacturer. And so they have to make sure their locks work every time. This means that they rounded the corners of the gate so that everything would work smoothly every time. This has the curious side effect of allowing you to measure precisely, very precisely, how far the fence has dropped inward into the, into the wheel pack. That is to say, how far the fence has, how close the fence has gotten to the center of the spindle. That's the little round thing in the middle, which is turning the whole business. And by making these measurements, you can put the whole wheel pack at a series of different positions and then literally measure the radius of the wheel pack at every position. And I'll get to that in a sec. How this works, these two points where the nose touches either end of the gate area are called contact points. It's a critical thing. The closer the nose gets to the spindle of the lock, that is to say, the further the fence can drop, the narrower the contact points seem to get. This is because these edges are rounded. And so as a function of distance, the gap seems to close. If you have a wheel pack where it's a larger diameter, at least at that particular point, because, say, there's no gate under the fence, then it seems to be pretty wide. And if you look very carefully at the graphic, some of you guys are probably going to have to get out your binoculars or something or look at the video online, you can see that in the left column, which is a relatively larger diameter wheel pack, the points where the nose touches the gate area are farther apart. In the right column, the points where the nose touches the gate area are closer together. It's pretty simple. To take advantage of this, you create a map of the radius of the wheel pack. If you're a mathematical type, then I can, I, you'd put this in the term, say it's a map of the radius of the wheel pack as a function of angular position. What it's doing is, at every for, you, you turn the dial three times, get all the wheels moving together, and then at every particular position, you map the radius of the wheel pack, that is how far away the contact points are. These contact points, since they get further apart as the wheel pack radius at that particular point seems to go up and go, get closer together as the radius goes down, means that where the contact points get further away, there probably isn't a gate in the wheel. And where their contact points get closer together, there may be a gate in the wheels. Exactly how this works is a matter of practice. You have to dial, depending on the lock, every couple of, you know, every, every couple of numbers is when you have to take your reading. And then you pop this on a piece of graph paper, go afterward and look, 
that's probably where there's a gate. And then you go back and do this again. After doing it you know, every two numbers, you, you figure out there might be a gate here. Let's make sure that it's actually a gate shape. Because if it's not, then it's probably a manufacturing error. And the last thing you want to do is waste another 15 or 20 minutes trying to dial test combinations to figure out that, no, you just found a flaw on the wheels. Great if you're a quality tester, not so good if you're a safe cracker. What you do here is you go back and we find by dialing, every, by checking every half number for that particular range that this little aberration is in fact gate shaped. And so we should probably include that as a number in the combination that we're slowly putting together. This begs the second question, and I'll take questions at the end if you don't mind. Which wheels gate are we seeing? We found one number, but this is a three number combination. Is it the first number, is it the second number, or is it the third number? Or technically speaking, is this a gate in the first wheel, a gate in the second wheel, and a gate in the third wheel? The reason I make this clarification is because when you're manipulating, one of the most important things you want to do is be able to visualize what's going on, going on in the lock. Because that's how you, how you intuitively find solutions to problems to which there isn't an immediate tech, textbook solution. To figure out which gate in the wheel we've actually found, which wheel or what is it we're looking at, you dial three different combinations. You pick some number far away from the location on the dial of the gate that we found, and you take the, that some random number, which I'm using 22 for in this particular example, you set the other two wheels, which we're discarding for the moment, to that random number, and the test wheel, and this for the first combination, the first wheel, you dial that number. So if we go back here, it looks like this number is at 22. And the example I wrote up here is the other way of doing it. So I'll switch over and bear with me for a sec as I realize that I completely forgot how I wrote this particular presentation. Basically, 20, the, the number of the combination is somewhere around 22, plus or minus a half a number, which is irrelevant. So we used number 22, we set the other wheels at you know, 67. We set the first wheel at 67, other two wheels at 22. Check, make our measurements again. Second time round, we set the second wheel at, 20, at 67 and the first and the third wheels at 22. Do this again, setting the third wheel to that some random number and the first wheels at 22. The upshot of all this, trying three different combinations, is that when we make our measurements, we will see that for two of these cases, the measurements stay the same. Because if you remember back here, this first picture I showed you, one wheel is the one that we're riding on. The other two wheels, no matter where those two other two wheels are, it doesn't matter. It's not going to figure into the calculations, not going to figure into the measurements. So the instant we get the gate in that one wheel out from under the fence, the measurements are going to change. Once those measurements change, then we know exactly which wheel has that gate in it at that position. And we're a third of the way there. Some of you guys have probably figured out the next two steps. Wash and repeat. Never mind about the wash part. But what you do is you repeat, knowing this thing for this one wheel, for the rest of the manipulation procedure, you leave that one wheel with that one gate in that one position. In this case, we say that the first wheel had the gate in it. We would leave the first wheel at 22 and then just play with the second and third wheels. And then do this again for the second and third wheels. And once we figure out which, where the gate is in those wheels, we do this again for the last remaining wheel and we have the combination and we have the safe open. Now, this is all very complicated and some of you guys are probably wishing you'd brought your hip class to the presentation. And the rest of you guys are probably asleep. And some small fraction of you guys are saying, hey, this is really cool, how can I learn how to do this? There's a couple things which make it learning it easier. First of all, get yourself a practice lock, a, manipula a cutaway designed for learning to manipulate. And I've got one right here. They're, I mean, you can buy them on eBay. I got this thing for 40 bucks some while ago. It's a safe lock mounted to a stand so you can leave it on your desk and your boss thinks you're all badass. And on the back, it's cut away so you can see the inner workings of the lock. Now, nobody except for the, the couple guys here in the front can see what I'm doing, but I'm going to do it anyway, just for their benefit. 
when you twirl it, you can, you can watch the gates move under the fence. 